So um, we're having Max Moore, a philosopher and futurist who has dealt extensively with transhumanism and life extension research, um, cryonics in particular. So let's ask directly, Max, what do you think about death? I think it's a pretty awful thing and it's a problem that we should do something about. It's something that we've been stuck with throughout our history <clears throat> and because of that people will rationalize uh, the value of death they think is a good thing because that's what they're used to. And if you're used to something, you have to find a reason why it must be good because otherwise it's pretty unbearable. So a lot of people, when we talk about the idea of doing something about death, about extending life, they say, oh no, you mustn't do that because death gives meaning to life or uh, without death we'll become bored. All of which is complete nonsense and just a complete rationalization. I think death, uh, involuntary death is a horrible thing. Uh, it should be something you can choose if you want. If you've decided after 100 years or 1,000 or a million that you've had enough, that's your choice, but it shouldn't be imposed on us. Yeah, I completely agree with you. So um, what cost you to get into the transhumanist and longevity community, actually? What was the cause? Well, it's always hard to say that, really. It's almost like I have a gene for it, in some sense. Uh, since I was very young, I've been interested in well, well, space, since I was about five years old, watching the Apollo landings. I've always been interested in technology in the future. By the time I was in my early teens, I was already taking supplements, and by the time I was 16 or 17, I was interested in life extension, which was you know, way back, um, you know, before 1980. So it was a very natural thing for me, uh, always questioning limits. You know, why are we stuck on this planet? Why are we stuck with aging? Um, so I kind of... Uh, reading all these different ideas, I put together the idea of extropy, which is a form of transhumanism, and essentially got the transhumanist movie go movement going. Um, because to me, it has all these, the common element of all these different things like space, life extension, augmenting the brain, they're all about overcoming limits. Uh, nature has given us these amazing brains and bodies, which are fantastic, but they're also highly limited. And that there's nothing sacrosanct about their capabilities. It's just an accident of nature and evolution. So why shouldn't we work on improving them? Yeah. So um, you mentioned you started taking supplements at a very early age. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing right now, actually, to, um, to, to stay healthy and age as slow as possible in terms of supplementation, in terms of diet, sleep or longevity treatments, uh, which are available right now or basically anything else? Yeah, there's nothing really today that will extend maximum lifespan. Uh, a lot of people have claimed this, but in my talk tomorrow I'll be having a very long list of all these theories of aging, all these interventions. Nothing really works for human beings. I mean, maybe with uh, you know, calorie restriction you might reduce the risk of certain diseases, maybe you live a little bit longer, but all these things that work so well in mice and other animals don't work so well in humans. So it's a little bit depressing at this point, and I've been following this for you know, four decades or so, and we really haven't made much progress. So currently it's kind of boring. The best things you can do are diet, exercise, get enough sleep, uh, have a good strong social circle. We're kind of boring non-tech things, right? But today that's the best thing you can do. Now there are some new things, there are things like rapamycin and uh, maybe experimental gene, gene therapies, but uh, those are not really well developed, not really well proven. So we're still in the kind of research phase and figuring out how these things work. And only in the last few years has much money been going into, into supporting this research. So although I haven't seen much progress in 40 years, in, in, in effect, I'm hopeful that in the next few years, especially with artificial intelligence perhaps kicking in and helping us to discover things faster, maybe we'll make progress. It'd be better because I'm in my 60th year now and I'm not looking forward to getting a lot older. Right, so we clearly need something better than what we have now. So um, tell us, what actually is the rationale for cryonics? Why is it supposed to work? Well, the idea of cryonics is that, uh, well, right now, since we don't have life extension technologies and we don't know where they come about, it makes sense to have a plan in place. I call it the plan A. Some people call it plan B. But this is your backup plan. If we don't make it, um, it'd be nice to see the future. So the idea of cryonics basically is uh, we take someone at the point of legal death, which is not biological death, it's not real death, uh, it's really the point where a doctor gives up on you because today's medicine can't do anything more for you. And then realizing that death is not, is not a point, it's not something that just happens, it's a process, a gradual process, which is why we can revive people often after uh, minutes or even an hour of clinical death in some cases. So the goal is really to press the pause button on dying, that stop the process, stop you getting worse, and the way we do that in cryonics is by storing you at extremely cold temperatures. Uh, minus uh, 196 degrees Celsius. Now, it's not that simple. There's a lot of things we have to do. We have to remove the blood from the body and from the cells and replace that with a, a vitrification solution. So instead of actually literally freezing, uh, the solution just becomes thicker and thicker and holds the cells in place. And so once you've done that, you can then store the patient at that extremely cold temperature. And it doesn't matter whether it's going to be a year or 100 years, you essentially be in the same condition. And given all that progress, it doesn't seem implausible to me that if you preserve the person well enough, we will eventually have technology that can reverse that process, undo the aging process, and let you carry on living. So it'd be a bit, by being in a, a bit like being in a coma, in a sense, except with no metabolism. You'll wake up with no idea of how long has passed and be able to continue living. Right, makes sense to me. Um, 
So um, there's the concept of uh, information uh, theoretic death actually mm -hmm. um, in the cryonics field. So could you briefly explain what it is? It's very important for cryonics to, that people understand what death is and isn't. Now we've had different definitions of death over time. So it used to be that if you stop breathing, your heart stopped, that was it, you were dead. And until about 1960, that was a, seemed like a pretty good definition because there's nothing we could do. After 1960, we started inventing uh, resuscitation methods. Actually, we've done these for centuries, but they just weren't very good. People used, used bellows to pump air into people's lungs and that kind of thing. Um, but we found that uh, you know, using CPR, pumping on people's chest, giving them electric shocks, various other methods, can actually bring people back from what was considered death. So whereas in 1960, you know, if that happened to you, we just said, that's it, he's dead. Now we say, no, we need to do something about this, otherwise clinical death, which is really just a cessation of heartbeat and respiration, will become biological death. So we have clinical death, which is just the heartbeat stopping and breathing stopping. We've got legal death, which is really a kind of an arbitrary thing that the doctor says, I declare you to be dead. Well, they can choose when to do that. They can maybe even resuscitate you, but maybe it's not worth it. And there's biological death, which is when the cells uh, decay beyond a point that with today's technology we can revive. But even that's not real death. The idea of information theoretic death is, well, what makes you the person you are? What makes you survive over time? Our view is it's basically the structure of your brain that holds your memories and your personality. So long as that's sufficiently intact and could be revived by future technology and repaired, you're not really gone. So you're not alive, obviously, because you're not functioning, but you're not dead either. And people have a hard time with that concept. If you're not alive, you must be dead. Well, no. You know, we have nighttime, we have daytime, but we also have twilight in between. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit difficult for people to understand. But uh, yeah, death is, is, is a gradual process. If you can stop it early enough, then you know, who knows what the future can bring. Right. So we've heard about the principles behind cryonics. What, to your mind, are some problems with um, cryonics um, that still need to be solved? There are some technical problems and there are practical problems. The practical ones are pretty tough. Uh, to do this properly, you really want to be there at the bedside when legal death is declared. That's by far the best process. In fact, ideally, and you can do this now in some jurisdictions in the US and elsewhere, people can actually choose when they want to go. If, if they're terminal, they can say, I want to go, and you can, you know, they can inject themselves with something that will stop their heart functioning. That's ideal because you can actually schedule it. You can call up your cryonics organization and say, two weeks from now, I want to be ready, and you have a team there at the bedside, and basically within seconds of legal death being declared, you can begin the process. So that's ideal, but that's not the way it often works. If you have a heart attack and you're alone, who's going to know for hours? Now, there are ways around that, where there's heart monitors and other devices that we're looking at that could maybe send us a signal, um, uh, some simple ones where you have to call in twice a day, otherwise we'll, we'll you know, see what's going on. But that's kind of the scariest thing, that something could go wrong and there'll be a long delay. And the longer the delay, obviously, the worse shape you're going to be in. Uh, a couple of hours is not necessarily disastrous, but beyond a certain point, we probably can't cryoprotect the brain. You're going to get a lot of ice formation in the brain, which, again, may not be something that we is beyond our power to solve in the future, but it's not something you want, obviously. The goal of cryonics is to preserve you in as good condition as possible. So the earlier we do that, the better. So that's kind of a practical problem. You know, a few decades ago, basically, we didn't know how to vitrify people. Vitrification is the idea that instead of forming ice crystals, you, you change the water out and you replace it with a uh, basically a glycerol-based solution, but there's much more modern variants of that. Uh, in the early days, we didn't have very high concentrations, and these solutions were pretty toxic to cells. So you were, the benefit was you were reducing ice formation, but the downside was there was a lot of toxicity. Uh, so over, over the years, those solutions have been improved considerably, uh, which is why today we're seeing increasing advances with organ preservation. Um, uh, just a few weeks ago, there was announcements on rat uh, cryopreservation of organs, rat, rat kidneys, rabbit kidneys are being cryopreserved. So, and of course, there are many people walking around today who are cryopreserved as embryos. Uh, so we've made a lot of advances, but we need to keep pushing that to minimize the toxicity and keep improving it. Uh, the big problem really with cryonics right now is people say, have you brought anybody back? Well, obviously not, because while we can cryopreserve corneas and heart valves and skin, these are individual tissues which you can rewarm pretty rapidly, which is what you have to do. There's this weird phenomenon, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, called uh, recrystallization. So as you warm someone up, ice crystals can actually reform and cause a lot of damage. So you have to re rewarm extremely rapidly. And with these tissues, they use uh, radio frequency rewarming, nanoparticles, methods like that. But scaling that up to even like an individual kidney or a heart is quite difficult. And for a whole body, it's just something we can't do today. Now, of course, it doesn't mean we can't do it in the future. We keep making progress, but it will take some time. So cryonics is really two things. It's get the person preserved today, and then sometime in the future, that's revive them, refix the cells, and bring them back. We can't do that part today. We can start working towards it with nanotechnology, but we can do the first part. And that's okay, because we have time once you're at that temperature. Right. Another objection that uh, people have come up with um, is like, um, well, if, if they decide to sign up for Coronix, um, sign a contract, how can they actually be 
completely sure that they won't be used as um, guinea pigs um, <laughs> to test uh, the technology to, to revive people. Of course, you could say that this technology you know, will only be used when um, it, it's proven to work properly for humans, but how would you know that this is the case when you've never tested it on a corrupt observed uh, human being? Well, I think that's kind of an extremely implausible scenario for a couple of reasons. One is that, first of all, ethics committees wouldn't let you do that. You get into a lot of trouble, but be put in prison. So, I mean, it's kind of ludicrous to start with. Plus, of course, we're going to test this on animals, first of all. We, we already have, I mean, I have, I have my dog cryopreserved. Obviously, you're going to do, we're already doing microscopic worms. We'll do uh, small animals, rabbits, uh, dogs, cats, monkeys, maybe. So, before we even try humans, we're going to have a lot of practice and a lot of, of proof. And if we can do it 100% of the time with an ape, then we can do it with humans. Plus, we'll have much better scanning technology. We can look at, at the brain and we'll have a good idea of what kind of condition it's in and whether it's going to work. So there has to be someone who goes first, obviously, but I think by that time we will have a pretty good idea that it's going to work. Certainly the kind of science fiction scenario that they're going to bring you back to take your organs is ludicrous because we'll be growing organs and having artificial replacements. Right. Um, and maybe another um, concern that some people have um, when, um, like, for example, I talk to them about cryonics. Um, how can one be sure that a cryonics company won't stop operating in the future? So the would be absolutely no chance of revival if the company you know, just decides to stop operating. Well, it's not quite true. Uh, it could be that another organization takes you over. It's like companies go bankrupt. That doesn't necessarily mean all their assets disappear. Mm -hmm. They may transfer them, have them bought up by someone else. And that's not very well organized right now, but I imagine that there'll be better agreements among organizations. But yes, it's certainly a valid concern. Uh, all I can say is that in the early days of Chronics, in the 1960s, uh, there are several organizations went under, they, they, they failed, but we've learned a lot since then. For instance, we know that we can't rely on relatives to pay for you for decades, they're not going to do that. So uh, cryonics organizations these days require that you pay up, up front, basically with life insurance or a trust fund, otherwise it's asking for trouble. Uh, the Alcor Foundation has been around for over 50 years now, so it's a pretty good track record, and it's a non-profit organization, and if you look at the oldest organizations in the world, they're all non-profits, they're religious organizations, they're universities, that kind of thing. Uh, my university has been around for like half a millennium, so hopefully if we organize it right, then they can survive for the long term. Uh, Alcor, for instance, uh, is currently fairly unique in this. And they, when you pay for the procedure, they take a big chunk of that money, put it aside in a separate trust fund with its own board of directors. It can't be used for any other purpose other than to, to, to keep them cryopreserved and eventually revive them. And the amount they put in there is calculated to never run out, even with a modest investment. So yeah, we thought about this pretty carefully, and so far after 50 years or so, it seems to be going okay. But yeah, there's no guarantee, obviously. Maybe the government will decide we're going to ban it, or terrorists blow up the building. I mean, there's no guarantee. If it is reasonable to get uh, crowd preserved, um, why do we think are so few older people interested in it? It's a mystery. I mean, it's, it's uh, there's a number of reasons. First of all, most people haven't heard about it. It's hard for me to believe that because I've given hundreds of talks and interviews and, you know, how can everyone not have heard about this? But many people don't even know the idea. Or if they do, it's kind of a vague science fiction idea they saw in a movie. They don't think it's a real thing. So that's the first obstacle. We have to educate them that it even exists. And then when they do hear about it, they have a lot of misconceptions about it. They think it's... Uh, you know, they think you're going to be a zombie or something. I mean, I don't know what they think. Um, but there's a couple of big problems. Uh, one is like a, an embarrassment factor that it's an unusual idea. It seems a bit strange and weird to people. It's not commonplace. It's not normal. So many people, I find it hard to relate to because I don't care what people think. But most people do care what other people think, what their family or friends. If they think you can do something strange, then they kind of shy away from it. That's actually a very strong force. It's hard for me to appreciate, but it's real. Um, another one, I think a big obstacle... There's two big obstacles. Uh, one is uncertainty. People hate uncertainty. They want to be very sure about things. They're very sure of their own opinions, that they're right about things. Uh, they tend to be very strong in their belief about an af afterlife. Either there is one or there isn't. If there is one, well, why do we need cryonics? If there isn't one, well, that's a good thing because death gives life to meaning, gives meaning to life and so on. So people have to settle themselves with that. And along we come and say, well, you know, there might be a possibility. I'm not guaranteeing anything. It might be possible to bring you back at some point in the future. I don't know when. That's not very good sales pitch. They don't want to hear that. So you know, we could be dishonest and say, oh, we guarantee it. We'll bring you back on February 1st, 2086. And we we'll probably get a lot more people being interested because that's what they want. But we don't have that. So that's another big problem. Another one is that uh, most people, the vast majority of people probably, have a very negative view of the future. You know, they're bombarded by science fiction that has Terminators killing humans or you know, Mad Max wastelands or viruses you know, killing everybody. So that's what people think, of, or, or global warming boiling the planet. You know, everybody, thinks, everybody has this view of the future as a horrible place. Whereas to me, that's extremely implausible because 
the most plausible way to think about the future is to look at the past and project the long-run trend. And the long-run trend is very clear. Despite what you see in the newspapers, this is the best time ever to be alive. And people just don't believe this, but go back and live in the past for a while and you'll see what it's like. I mean, just go back to where you didn't have anesthetic, where you didn't have antiseptics, and you die from a you know, toothache or an infected tooth. Uh, when women didn't have the vote, when we had slaves. I mean, it's ridiculous. The past was a horrible place. Today is, you know, we have our problems and we exaggerate our problems, but this is a good time. We live longer than ever, we're wealthier than ever, we're freer than ever. So I think the most plausible projection is to see that continuing. That doesn't mean a utopia, obviously, but uh, it means a world that I think is worth living in. Okay, so um, maybe on a final note, what is your prediction on how um, the field of cryonics and the field of life extension uh, in general um, will develop uh, in the near future? Well, I'm encouraged in that um, over the last few decades, I've got a little bit discouraged because it seemed like nothing was really happening in life extension. In cryonics, progress was really pretty minimal for a while. But recently, things have really been picking up. In life extension, obviously, there's now a lot of interest um, in funding this, not only from wealthy people, but places like Harvard even are putting money into this. Uh, the same with cryonics. We're now seeing actually major initiatives at top universities to do brain cryopreservation research. So obviously, with um, in vitro fertilization, there's a big market there for cryopreserving embryos. That got people thinking about how that can work. Um, and one big area that could be a potentially large market and save a lot of lives is human organ cryopreservation. Because right now, you know, in, just in the U.S. alone, tens of thousands of people die every year because they need a new heart or liver or pancreas, and you've got to ship it from one side of the country to another on ice. And in many cases, the tissue match doesn't work or it's too late. But imagine you could actually cryopreserve organs, keep them in a tissue bag in the hospital, and as needed, defrost them, basically. Uh, that would be a very big thing. So that's kind of the, the research focus right now, is let's go from tissues to organs. And if we can solve that problem, well, it looks like we're getting there again with the rat and, and rabbit kidney research. It looks like we're actually on the edge of succeeding. So that makes me a little more uh, optimistic that we can make this work. To me, the most important part is the brain, and that's an organ. I don't actually feel like I need to preserve the whole body. This is all replaceable, you know, with, with uh, reinstructing the genes, we could grow a new body and new hands. But the most important part you can't replace is the brain, because that wouldn't be me. So I'm getting more optimistic that we can actually solve these problems. Uh, for life extension, though, I'm not as optimistic as some people at this conference might be. Um, again, I've been watching this for 40-some years, and I'm now in my 60th year. I don't know how much longer I have, so we need to make faster progress. So this is why I argue that you should put cryonics in place first, because that's something you can do today. You, know, you can't take fantastic gene therapies that don't exist, but you can do cryonics. So do that first, and then decide uh, what new therapies you might take in the future. Great. Max, thanks for your time. Well, thank you.